morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, our chief elder, the concerned Moravians welcome you to our worship service. We want to deeply thank Beth Abram of Moravian Church, the first Moravian Church in the Southern Province for their gracious hospitality in providing a place for our worship and especially Phil Sapp for his continuing helpfulness in setting the church up for us. Thank you, Phil, and thank you, Beth Abra Moravian Church. In the way of announcements, I've, I've, I've been placed in a situation where I have a little bit of schizophrenia. I've been asked to announce two chicken pie sales at, at the same time. Beth Avra is having one today. Uh, and if, 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 if you're not into driving a little ways, uh, Beth Avra has chicken pies for sale. Friedberg invites the, the concerned Moravians to stop by for their chicken pie takeaway supper today from 1 to 6 p.m. Each meal contains chicken pie, gravy, green beans, corn, yams, Moravian slaw, roll, and a dessert. It's a killer meal. <laughs> it costs just $12 a plate. Frozen chicken pies are also available while supplies last. And Friedberg Church is located at 2178 Friedberg Church Road. So you have your choice of a good Moravian tradition and both, both are delicious. In the way of books, Mountain, the books Mountain of Despair, God's Word, and Moravian Voice will be available for pickup as you leave the lobby. You're welcome to these, and they're good books. Our next service is in planning for January, and we'll advise the date in September. I do want you to stay tuned closely because we're in the process of lining up some very significant speakers. Uh, and I'm telling you, they will be significant. Our group is growing. Our, our Moravian Concerned Group, Concerned Moravian Groups is growing. We started with over a thousand signatures in only the Southern Province, and that number is increasing. In addition, the African and Czech provinces can, are building strong relationships with us. If you're not on our email distribution, there will be a sign-up sheet in the lobby as you leave. If you don't have email, you can sign up to receive information via snail mail. And if you'd like to make a contribution to the Concerned Moravians to help in printing and mailing costs, an offering plate will be in the lobby. And may I ask Luke Bell to lead us now in prayer. Thank you, Father. For your word made flesh, namely Jesus of Nazareth, and yet uh, the resurrected Lord of glory, our hope and our salvation. Namely, he said he is the way and the truth and the life. We believe that, Lord. And we're thankful because you are the truth, Jesus, who has come to set us free from ourselves and our lie and our sin. And so, Lord, uh, un unleash your church, Lord, to be the church you have uh, created us to be in this day and time, not only within the Moravian church, but across uh, this planet and certainly within this country and culture that is in deep bondage to itself. So, Lord, hearken and have mercy. And may you uh, help yourself to our lives, Lord, individually, collectively, we might be found anew, Lord, hearing your claim and call on our lives to be the church you yourself are building. We thank you for being present, Lord. You are always present. Our calling is to be present to you. So Lord, we make ourselves available and vulnerable to you and one another and what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our opening hymn is My Hope is Built. Number 771, may we stand together if we can to sing. <clears throat> Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking. 
the ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covenant, his blood sustain me in the raging flood. When all supports are washed away, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. With his righteousness alone, redeemed to stand before his throne. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Please be seated. In a way, my introduction is of the Reverend Luke Bell is, is redundant, but uh, I, I will tell you what I think anyway. And I want to introduce you this morning to the man that will bring our message, Reverend Luke Bell. We met Luke when he came to our last meeting. The questions that he asked and the responses he gave were given with such clarity of thinking deep devotion to Christ and the Bible, and strong logic that we were all blown away, all the folks that were here that heard him. We approached him and asked if he would bring today's message. Luke Bell is a true Renaissance man. He can do almost anything. A graduate of Duke Divinity School, he successfully escaped Duke without being overly corrupted. <laughs> That's for all you UNC fans. He has served pastorates in both the Moravian and Methodist churches. If you have seen any beautiful brickwork in buildings, the brick was probably laid by Luke or one of his vocational school pupils. The beauty of being a capable brick mason is that you can look at a building and say with pride, I built that with my own hands. And that's a special kind of pride when you, when you make a beautiful meal or when you, when you do work like that, you, you look at it and say, I did that. Luke is currently an instructor at the Vintage Bible College on University Parkway, and I know you're going to receive blessings from the message you're about to hear. Reverend Luke Bell. Well, thank you, Brother John. I appreciate uh, the invitation. And uh, really, before we start, I, I need to share something with you, like I always do with all the classes I do. In fact, I did it six weeks ago. I've been doing that for 10 years at least. But uh, just, to, just to let everybody know uh, when we start a class, but I, uh, you can't trust me. I, I know I'm the guy up front, but uh, you can't trust me. I mean no harm, but uh, I don't trust any of you. And you could say, well, how, how can you say that? You don't even know me. Well, you came from the same garden I came from, so I can't trust you. You can't trust me. Uh, however, you can trust Christ in me, and, and I can trust Christ in you, and that's where we're going to need to meet. 
You don't need my opinion, mean no harm, don't want your opinion. Opinions never set anybody free, but the truth has set us free. And so with joy, I have the, the privilege of saying and let you know at the front end, you can't trust me. So my obligation to the Lord and to you is to present not Luke Bell, ring a ding ding, but to, to present Christ and him crucified our only confession of faith. So I want to be careful to do that, and particularly, let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of each and every one of our hearts prove acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The passage on your uh, sheet is uh, Proverbs 29, verse 18. If you'd like to look along in that particular passage, Proverbs 29, 18, I learned a long time ago, I'll get into that a little bit more, but it has everything to do with leadership, it has everything to do with leadership. In fact, I've learned throughout all the careers I've had and the things I've done, whether it's ministry, whether it's the army, whether it's Brickland, whether it's teaching, uh, where, where there's no vision, where there's no leadership, the people perish. And so listen again for this passage, Proverbs 29, verse 18, where there is no revelation or prophetic vision, where there is no vision, depending on the different translation, where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint or they perish. But happy is he who keeps the law, obviously the law of God. Where there's no vision, where there's no prophetic vision, the people perish. I remember in the army, um, and I was going to learn early on, this is actually 29, excuse me, 49 years ago this month. This was the middle of November of 1972. I was a 22-year-old rifle platoon leader in the 8th Infantry Division in Germany. I had 36 men were out in the field for, uh, for a month. And this particular uh, training time, we had uh, what they call mechanized infantry platoon uh, tactical inspection, where you were being in the field and you had to do all this training, you were being graded. All the rifle platoons in the whole division were being graded. And so what I had learned in infantry officer candidate school, because I had enlisted, then I went to infantry officer candidate school, and two years before I was made a lieutenant and an officer and a gentleman, so to speak, as they say. So now I'm here and I'm taking this very seriously because one of the things I learned, Vietnam was going on uh, while I was in infantry officer candidate school. There's a good chance I would go to Vietnam. And so everything you did had to do was to the death. The mission was more important than us men because other people's lives depended on it. The idea was to accomplish the mission and keep your men alive, obviously, but if all came uh, push to shove, uh, the mission comes first. So here I am uh, in the field. I'm, I'm getting ready to brief my men uh, on, on the attack because, see, we're preparing for the Cold War to go hot. And if it went hot, the Soviet motorized rev regiments would come through the Fulda Gap, which is a train feature over towards the East German border. And we would have to be ready to meet them. We were paratroopers, but in case they didn't have airplanes, they gave us armored personnel carriers as well because you can't outwalk motorized uh, vehicles coming at you. So here we are in the field. And about the time I'm ready to brief my men, this shiny helicopter comes in. On it is a, is a star, a white star painted with a little tag uh, red behind it. That meant this is a general officer. This was the assistant division commander, a one-star general. He's coming in, so he gets off of his helicopter. He's walking towards me. We're on this live fire range, because we're gonna have to 50 calibers, a range of seven miles. We've got machine gun, we've got it all. We're, we're coordinating what we needed to do. And he comes over with his aide, who's a first lieutenant, same rank as I am, I salute the general, and I said, yes, sir, what can I do for you? He said, uh, Lieutenant, I want a briefing of what you're about to do. I said, yes, sir. 
So I pulled out my map sheet, threw it on the ground, picked up a stick off the ground and started briefing the general. We're gonna fire and maneuver, gonna call in air support and artillery. Sir, are there any questions? He had no questions, I saluted him. He walked back to his helicopter with his lieutenant aide. So I'm turning around trying to get my men focused on this mission. And then I noticed that the lieutenant was coming back over. The general's aide was coming back over to me. Well, I didn't have to salute him. <laughs> We're the same rank, but I said, what is it, lieutenant? What's, what's up? He said, uh, lieutenant, the general wants to know why you didn't have a more professional pointer for the briefing. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. I, I was a little hot. I, I'm a little, uh, I'm chagrined to use one of the bigger words. I'm really upset. I'm trying to brief my men on a mission. And he comes over worried about my pointer. This isn't division headquarters where you have the dog and pony show and the cupcakes and the coffee urn, General. This is the person that's going to be making decisions if we in fact go to war over our lives and the mission that we're supposed to, this is what's gonna be thinking for us. And so when I ran into Proverbs 29, 18 some years later, because it would be a few more years before I became a Christian, Whoa, where there is no vision, where there is no leadership, the people perish. As a brick mason, <laughs> if you don't go by the vision, namely the architect's rendering, the blueprint, if you don't go by that, you have just put yourself out of business. And in the life of the church, as a pastor in these several denominations, I left the United Methodist Church and I was probably in one of the most uh, conservative uh, conferences in the whole United Methodist system, the Alabama, West Florida. I left them in uh, D-Day, June 6, 1995, because I could see what was coming. The general church is gonna vote on the truth. Please help me understand, how do you vote on the truth? How, how is it possible to vote on the truth. You can accept it or reject it. You cannot vote on the truth. You cannot legislate state the truth. So I left, went back to Lane Brick, moved back to North Carolina, and I'm listening for five and a half years where the Lord want me to do ministry-wise. Where there's no vision, the people perish. You see any of that perishing going on around here? Is that possibly a reason that you're here today? Have you noticed any perishing going on, namely in the Moravian Church? I see it in the Methodist Church. I just thank God y'all have concerned Moravians. My wife was saying to me the other day, because she was a Methodist pastor for uh, 11 years, I wonder if any other denominations are going through this, mainly the mainline denominations, have any groups like this group. I just thank God the, the leadership meeting Lynn and I got to go to two weeks ago. Wow. We, we thought, well, we, we wondered about it. We were concerned about the concerned Moravians initially. Please, please, please bear with me, man. Uh, we were concerned about the concerned Moravians. I thought, whoa, is this about two chicken pies? Is this about the little, uh, little this and that? No. Thank God, no. We sat down with the people. and We started hearing the hearts of the leadership of your group. And we realize, no, this is about the faith. This is about the scripture. This is about the authority of God himself. And so, uh, thank God for you. Thank God for you being here. One of the things I learned throughout all these careers and these different institutions I was a part of, and I believe it started with the general back when, but when the means becomes the end, it is now compromised. It is no longer about the mission. It's about our job security. It's about our position. It's about our authority. 
I saw that in the army as I noted. I saw that in education when I taught vocational education, uh, high school as well as uh, uh, older adults. And then I've certainly seen it in the various denominations I've been a part of. And then looking at church history. This is not something new. Folks, as folks sin is sin, Lord have mercy. We will re-erect towers of Babel and we have done so across history and thinking God won't notice. With God, it is a gravity feat. <laughs> if we build on sinking sand, what do you expect to happen? It's coming down. And by that's divine judgment. God loves us enough to say no. He says no to sin. He loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. Why is that so hard to understand? Because we have partaken of the forbidden fruit. What is the forbidden fruit? An apple? Oh, let's look at Genesis chapter 3, if we may. Might as well start at the starting place. Genesis chapter 3. In chapter 2, Adam has been created. And God says to Adam, he says uh, over here in chapter 2, verses 16 and 7, Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you will surely die. Please be mindful. God has told Adam this. Eve has not been created. Okay? She's not on the scene yet. But the woman you gave, I mean, she's not even there. So how is she going to know this unless he tells her? Uh-oh, guys. Uh-oh. Blame her and blame God. That'll get you in real good trouble. I'm still thinking, and I shared it with somebody earlier, but Adam, if he was a little quicker, I just know Adam like I wish I didn't know Adam, the first Adam. I'm trying to get to know the second Adam, namely Jesus, but the first Adam, I know him, but I'm surprised he didn't ask for his rib back. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Lord have mercy. Thank God he didn't get his rib back or we would not be here. In God's mercy... He did not get his rib back. And so here we have in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Let's create a little doubt. Doubt. Has God really said that? Verse 2, and the woman said to the serpent, she must have got this from Adam because she wasn't there when he, God gave the wisdom to Adam. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Well, God never said you can't touch it, so that's been added, but I suspect it was added by Adam. Maybe early on he just knew how she was. No, no, I'm, I'm trying to be careful here. He just knew how she, she was. No. Might as well be careful while we're being careful. We may not touch it. Then verse 4, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Boy, what a choice. If I can be like God, and I won't need God. And I won't need Adam. I can be all on my own. And so she saw there, and so the lie begins there. Who are you going to trust? God or yourself? And so in verse uh, 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desiring to make one wise, she took of it and fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her. So he's right there. He can't sub out the blame to her. And sin loves come. Hey, have some of this with me. She also gave to her husband, he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. 
How do you cover up your sin? How do you cover up your shame? How do you cover up a lie? I mean, you've got to have the best memory in the world when you start a lie. Now you've got to remember who, who you told that lie to. You know how that goes. A long lie that always goes back to this wrong tree. Do not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And every one of us have partaken of the true fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's why I said to begin with, you can't trust me. And again, I can't trust you. We are sinners in need of saving. How would we ever know that? How would we ever know that we are sinners in need of saving? We've got the general revelation, creation. Whoa, there must be a God. But that won't tell you that you're a sinner in need of a saving Savior. How would we know that? Apart from the Holy Scripture. The revelation of God, the special revelation of God. Please understand. Before the fall, God created everything good and very good. Emotionally, everybody's in a good place. Intellectually, they got the right information. Everything is good. But when the fall happened, it didn't happen at the point of information. They had the right information. Don't eat this piece of fruit. The forbidden fruit. Emotionally, they can't blame anybody. They're in a perfect environment. So where did the fall happen? At what point did the fall happen? It happened at the point of the will. They disobey the will of God. That's where sin happens. That's why when the second Adam comes, namely Jesus Christ, he comes. And in uh, Luke 9, 23 to 26, Jesus will say, if, notice how we always get a choice. Why? Because we're creating the image and likeness of God. We're not animals who live by instinct, who can't sin. We're not robots that can be programmed, even though we're in the image and likeness of God. In the fall, the likeness suffered, and it's got to be restored. That's why Jesus came from the highest heaven at the right time, as it says in Galatians, God sent his son. Why? To restore the likeness. That's why we must be born again. Otherwise, we will remain children of wrath. <laughs> And he desires that none perish. He desires that none perish. And yet Jesus will say, broad is the way that leads to destruction and many go therein. Narrow is the way that leads to life and few be those who find it. See, we can choose not to be chosen. Whoa. But Jesus said, you didn't choose me. I chose you to go bear fruit and that your fruit might abide. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Not what this guy said in the Winston-Salem Journal. <laughs> in a city that was founded in the name of Jesus by Moravian Christians. When he wrote to uh, Jesus is not the only way to salvation. What a lie from the pits of hell. And yet the leadership, the PEC, allowed him to retire some years later. See, tolerance is not a biblical word. We got the truth. Truth will set you free. And then working through these battles and getting called downtown to the PEC a number of times and sitting before them and asking me why I did what I did, namely write all the letters to all the bishops and all the clergy and all the lay leadership in the, in the province. Why did you do that? I said, well, I did it because you haven't. You should have come to us. Why would I come to you? You are the gatekeeper. So who preaches and teaches in the life of this church? You are the ones that do the ordaining. I'm just a new guy. I'm not even eligible for the pension for another couple of months. 
Why would I need to explain that to you? Well, they'd go and ask me some other questions. But you should have come to us. <laughs> Thank you. Now you're helping me make my case. Because what you're saying, you're trying to say that the church as institution is more important than Jesus, the chief elder. You see how the, the means becomes the end instead of the means to the end. Now it is blasphemy and idolatry to use the name of Jesus, and yet it, the church as institution has its own interest to serve. So it's not free to serve the interest of Jesus. Lord have mercy. Who in the biblical hell do we think we are? Do we not know who we're dealing with here? And so, uh, <laughs> the ends and means. I, I ask you, I ask you, dear sisters and brothers, where are your leaders? Where is the Provincial Elders Conference? Where are your pastors? Where are uh, your seminary professors? Where are your bishops? Why aren't they here? More importantly, why, why do you need to be here? If they were doing, where there's no vision, the people perish. Where there's no leadership, the people perish. Confusion is not leadership. And please understand, as I learned as a young infantry officer our mission is more important than us we have got to be prepared to die for one another and for this mission to be accomplished because other people's lives depend on what we do what i would suggest on a much greater level a more important level is that the gospel of jesus christ is much more important than our little horizontal mission because you understand, please, the first death for those who are in Christ is not the problem. <laughs> Jesus has overcome sin, sickness, and death. If Christ is in us, we must be raised from the dead. <laughs> and there are two resurrections. John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, the apostle talks about it. There is a, Jesus says it, and the apostle records, there is a resurrection to life, Jesus said, and there is a resurrection to damnation. And that resurrection to damnation has everything to do with the second death that is noted in the book of Revelation time and again. Where there's no vision, the people perish, not just lately, but eternally. So the work of the church, the body of Christ, the church Jesus is building is most important. I remember when I was laying brick and I'm at the time down at Fort Bragg, this has been about 21 years ago and I was going through the process to become a Moravian pastor. So it rained us out one morning there at Fort Bragg and so I thought, well, I lived in Santa, I'll go up through Lillington, North Carolina, way home, I got a little extra time, can't work. And so I remember a guy went to seminary, I saw his uh, name out on the front uh, scoreboard. Excuse me, I meant the, uh, the church sign. I meant such scoreboard, I'm sorry. A little slippage going on. <laughs> uh, but Bill, old brother Bill, had, we were in class together some years before, and I stopped by, I happened to catch him, and he poured me a cup of coffee, and we got to talking and just reminiscing from days at Duke, and then at the same time talking about ministry and what's happening. By this time, I've already left the United Methodist Church about six years before. And so I'm talking with Bill, and uh, he said, Luke, i got to tell you this. My wife and I, I've got five years till retirement. My wife and I, we have already decided the precise moment that I retire, we will never, ever again set foot in a United Methodist Church. It didn't hit me until I'm on my way home to Sanford. And the realization came. I said, Bill, Bill, Bill. You are no longer there for the Lord. You are no longer there for these people gathered in the congregation. You are there for your pension. You are there for yourself. You are compromised. You are a hireling, what it talks about in John chapter 10. How can we uh, preach faith, 
if we don't have faith. Unfortunately, six years ago, I'm up in Withfield, and I saw old Ray's name on the scoreboard of that church, a big fine church up in Withfield, Virginia. I thought, well, I'll see if I can get in on old Ray. I got in there, and he says, Luke, I got two years to retirement. He said exactly what Bill had said before. I would suggest maybe the reason your leadership is not here. So you don't have to be here. Might have something to do with self, which is the forbidden fruit. It's not an apple. It's a choice of self over God and others. In fact, I came up with a song some years ago at the Bible College. We went up to uh, uh, West Virginia, Charleston, and they had a rescue mission. And uh, we were going to have this worship service. So we came in, and uh, we had about eight or nine of us from the Bible College. We were helping out the ministry that week. And uh, the chaplain there at the rescue mission said, well, uh, by the way, you're preaching uh, today. I said, oh, fine. When, when does that happen? He said, well, right now. I said, oh, okay. Well, uh, okay. Like, you know, got to be prepared to preach and die at a moment's notice. It's one of those things. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, Lord, what you got? Uh, have mercy. And uh, so I got up in front of the people. And, uh, of course, it, those kind of circumstances, you may know this, but you you got to go to the worship service if you're going to eat. It's, it's one of those deals, you know. Got to go to the worship service to eat. So they're, they're there, you know, they're uh, I said, well, uh, dear brothers and sisters, I'm glad to be here. And I uh, didn't know I was going to be here right now, but I'm glad to be here for you. And uh, by the way, I'm going to teach you a song that you already know. And I know some people looked around like, <laughs> why would you teach us a song that we already know? I said, well, it's a song that everyone learns when they come through the birth canal. It doesn't matter what language, what part of the world, everyone knows this song when you come through the birth canal. So now I've really got their attention. <laughs> well, let's find out what about the song we already know. I said, well, in English, it goes like this. <clears throat> Let me get my throat clear just right. Just see if you recognize the song. It's all about me. Too bad about you. It's all about me. Too bad about you. Anybody recognize that song? Lord have mercy. And that's uh, the hymn of the fall. But it took a couple more years to hear the second verse. It's all about him. He's all about us. It's all about Jesus. He is all about us. He's all about us. Notice, I didn't say he's all about me. Two or more gathered in my name. 58 one another passages in the New Testament. Bear one another's burdens, so fulfill the law. Confess your sins, one another. Pray for one another. Love one another. There's no one another, and it's not the church Jesus is building. These people say, me and Jesus, and I'm no English teacher, please understand. Me and Jesus is bad grammar. I've been, I've, I've been taught that. Still got me first. No. He loves us, and he is the vision. And particularly his vision is, in Luke 9, 23 to 26, if anyone would follow me, let him or her deny themselves, pick up their cross every day, and follow me. Those who seek to save their life will lose it. Those who lose their life for my sake will find it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? That business about losing our life for his sake. Those who seek to save their life will lose it. That's in all four Gospels. 
That is the most reiterated thing Jesus has said in all the Gospels. If you want to know the vision, where there's no vision to people pray, if you want to know the vision of God for us, is to lose our life for his sake. That requires trust. I got to believe that he is exactly who he says. Is he worth dying for? And he is. But you can't tell anybody that. They got to prove it for themselves. How do you prove it for You obey. Just obey. What is it? If you love me, obey my command. People want to say, just prove God to me. I said, well, I proved him for myself. I can't prove him for you. But hey, you can prove him for yourself because you were to look at 1 John 2, 1 to 6. You'll find out if you just obey what he says, you too will know he is who he says he is. In fact, I've come to realize I know these are the words of God, not because the canons of the ancient church council say these are the words of God. You have to understand it personally. You have to get to that point. You know for a fact these are the words of God because it was written to faith, not reason. You can't rationalize your way through. You'll be cherry picking the whole thing. And that's what's been going on when they say, when the seminary theologians say, this is not essential. The Bible is not essential. Huh. Well, Let's just look back at Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> just, just, you don't have to turn to it. But just think with me in that statement. Let me go ahead and read it from Brother Modelinsky's book. I thought this was a powerful statement. Uh, he's just noting what uh, has been said. He said, uh, <clears throat> Professor Derive chapter 3, If the government imprisoned your bishops, burned your Bibles, closed your church buildings, and prevented you from celebrating baptism and Holy Communion, could you still be a Christian? If so, then none of these things are essential. Really? I notice he left out the seminary in case the seminary got burned out. Oh, he didn't mention the pension. Can, can you still be a preacher if there's no pension involved? Or a bishop or a seminary professor. Um, think with me. Then right next to the simultaneously, the next part of that is the scriptures are regarded. This is in the same part that the seminary has put out. Uh, the, the scriptures are regarded as the standard for the faith and doctrine of Moravian church. All theological teachings stand in need of being tested in light of the biblical message. Well, that's good. So how come we got the first part saying uh, the scriptures are not essential? In fact, I think it was during the Reformation time they came up with a nice saying. It's a nice saying. In essentials, unity. Non-essentials, liberty. All things love. That sounds real good. But it won't square with the scripture. Even that statement has got to stand the test. It's got to stand the test. Furthermore, I would suggest that uh, <coughs> uh, could you still be a Christian after your Bible got burned up? Well, that would beg the question is, if you didn't believe that the Bible was essential, you weren't a Christian to begin with before your Bible got burned up. And furthermore, if your Bible got burned up as a Christian, the first thing you want to do is go looking for a Bible. It's not something like, well, my Bible burned up, so I'm still a Christian. That's some of that once saved, always saved. When were you saved? Back in 1962, the year I bowled 300. Man, it was a great year for me. Really? To equate salvation with a, a perfect bowling game? Come on, people. What happened since 1960? Where has Jesus been in your life since then? Playing fast and loose with the things of God. Where the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's a reverential awe. Just who are we dealing with here? And these people say, well, there are no absolutes. Oh, really? That's an absolute statement, you just said. But there's no absolute except you're absolute. Furthermore, uh, how about your upcoming death? Will that not be absolute enough for you? You've got to think from your own mortality to get back to where you are now and then find out who's in charge. You're going to find out it's never been you, never going to be you. You need to thank God it's not you. Its name is Jesus. And he has come to set you free from feasting on the forbidden fruit of me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity. The lie from the pits of hell. It goes back to the wrong. The early church fathers, I appreciate this statement. They said the tree of life, 
I mean, why did we go? We, I, I'm including myself. I won't let, I know Adam. I wish I didn't know him. But uh, why did we go to the place we weren't supposed to go to? Go past all the other trees we could have had anything we want off. We went all the way to the place we weren't supposed to go. I've proven that with a little grandson. About two years old. Say, hey, don't touch what Nana's got over here. More he drops what he's doing, runs all over here to get hold of. <laughs> this is not ancient history, folks. But the fact of the matter is, the early church fathers said, what is the tree of life? It is the cross. Our life is found in his death. And consequently, because he has assigned a cross to each one of us, our life, my life has been found in seeking to pick up my daily cross to deny myself, lose my life for his sake, relationally and circumstantially, that he may be glorified and I might have a life in my giving of my life. And I've had people say, Brother Bell, that doesn't make sense. Right, it doesn't make sense. If it made sense, you wouldn't need faith, you wouldn't need Jesus. The reductionism in the seminary is trying to reduce it down to scholarship and rationalism. And that becomes the end instead of the means to the end. Scholarship is meant as a means to the end. Churchmanship is a means to the end. When I first got to Duke Divinity School almost 40 years ago, I come off the brick pile laying brick. Now I'm in uh, North Carolina, and I'm a pastor of a little church outside of Chapel Hill in the country. I'm going to seminary, and they're all saying, now your main function is seminary. It's all about scholarship. We teach a rigorous scholarship. Oh, really? Rigorous scholarship. How about some rigorous uh, discipleship? I think that's what I've been hearing is about make disciples, not scholars. And then I got to church, and of course I got to church, but whoa, it's all about churchmanship. Well, no, 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 it's, it's not about churchmanship, and it's not about scholarship, it's about discipleship, and Jesus let me know by the Spirit, if you just keep me first, seek ye first, and my kingdom, I will mitigate and navigate and balance out all these other claims on you, because you are mine. I have bought you at a price. To be set free... And to taste freedom. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 34. And once you've tasted that, you want to go back to the lie. And so, uh, so I would suggest uh, we have right here Genesis 3. Just, just again. Uh, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And then on down here. You will not surely die. For God knows that in every day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Please, please understand. What they're proposing in the seminary, the Bible is not essential. They're not the first to do that. Because that's what the serpent, Satan, is saying right here. God's word is, is, is not essential. In fact, not only there, but you see it over in Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 36, when the scrolls that Jeremiah has written, and they're taken by Baruch to the king, and he is sitting in his winter palace, and he cuts it up with his knife and throws it in the fire. He's saying these words are not essential. And over in Acts chapter 4, you've got uh, Peter and John, they're preaching, and there's teaching, and, and, and the Sanhedrin get hold of them and say, well, you're not allowed to preach and teach in his name. They're saying that the religious authorities are saying uh, Jesus' words are not essential. See, this is what uh, Mary and Martha there in Luke 10, 38 to 42. Mary and Martha, I appreciate Martha. She probably got the best chicken pie ever. I mean, excuse me, she's making a big pot. Of, uh, probably the best. You know, she had her best... Uh, her best... Uh, recipe out and in her pride she's going to try to feed the bread of life can you imagine she didn't recognize who was sitting in her home mary did she's sitting at his feet she's feasting on what jesus of course martha comes over like whoa man you got this sweat i've been sweat i'm trying to get this meal on tell my sister to come help me out you know the rest of that story no no i'm not going to tell her she sought the best, and the best is going to be hers. You're worried about too many things. You're trying to be in charge. 
you, Martha. You're going to have to learn you're not in charge. You've never been in charge. You need to thank God you're never going to be in charge. That's freedom. Where there's no vision, the people will perish. But then that back half of that passage, I'll read the whole thing. And where there's no revelation, vision, the people cast off restraint, perish. But happy is he who keeps the law, the words of God. As we know from John chapter 1, Jesus is the word of God, the word made flesh. And we get to feast on him. We get to have a life and it abundantly in his definition of abundance. Religiously, the problem has been across church history is we want to redefine the things of God. Church. And we can put it, the left has got its church and the right has got its church. But they're all brick jobs. Left and right. I'm going to venture to say this because I suspect most of y'all come from the right. That's where I come from. Raised in a military family. My father was a chief master sergeant. Uh, I I lived into all that. Oldest of five kids uh, in the army. I was a lieutenant. All of that. All of that business. But once I met Jesus and he spoke to me in my heart through his word. He said, follow me. Well, now I've got to find out where, where he is. What does that mean? Well, he's right where he's always been, at the cross, right here. And on this continuum, left and right, of history, and the pendulum swings left and right. Crossing here swings left and right, left and right. But Jesus is saying yesterday, today, and forever he doesn't budge no one is there naturally they have to come there supernaturally because naturally in our fallen nature we we have located ourselves just from our fallen nature on the left and right just just our fallen nature has its own desires and comforts on the left or right So what is he? The left wants me to come over. I'm not about to go to the left. And I know the folks on the left are not about to come over here. (laughs) No, we got to go where he is. In order to go where he is, wherever direction we come from, we must deny ourselves, pick up our cross every day. We have got to leave behind what we valued most because we have found the one who we most value and who has most valued us. While we're yet sinners, Christ has died for us. I must be somebody. <laughs> I finally found I must be somebody. You must be somebody. Our self-esteem rests not on who we know, what rank we were, how much money we got, what kind of car we drive, how much we own. We are somebody because God sent his only begotten son to die for us while we were yet a sinner. The blood of Jesus is our validation and our justification and our peace and our joy. So... So the church Jesus is building, and that's, that was my prayer for all these years. Uh, once I became a Christ, Lord, i got to find your church before I die. I'm dying to find your church. And I've been the preacher for a lot of these years. I've got to find the church. Because what we're building can't be the church Jesus is building because it looks like the gates of hell doing a quality job against what we've been calling church. But yet I remember him saying, I will build my church the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That church has got to be here somewhere. Why? Because he said it. He's the truth. He cannot lie. He's got to be here somewhere. Well, where is it? So I was out picking up the newspaper. After I left one of the other ministries, and I'm back laying bricks. I'm going about early 30, and I guess the Lord provided. He delivers it through the horizontal news just because I got a word for you. And I don't hear a voice. It because you know, and I hope and trust you know it this way, but you know that you know this is not something I would come up with. This is a revelation where there's no revelation, where there's no vision to people. So this revelation, so it took all these years. Luke, 
So I'm picking up the paper at 5 o'clock in the morning so I can drive to Greensboro and help build a block on this Lexus dealership. It was just going to be good to think about these things while I'm making the commute. You know what I mean. And the whisper of God said, Luke, the only way you will ever find my church is by dying to yourself. Of course. Of course. That's his call. That's his claim. All right. We're no longer our own. We bought at a price. We're not, we weren't our own by creation. We're not our own by redemption. Okay. Thank you, Lord. It's hard to convince people where the church Jesus is building because they've been churched. They've been churched on the left and right. Sometimes it's easier when somebody had never been to church and they come to Christ. Like, well, praise God, we don't have to deprogram them from all of that other stuff. The religiosity is what put Jesus to death. Religion continues to put Jesus to death. You, you are experiencing that in the life of the Moravian church. And yet, I suggest to you, sisters and brothers, a real consideration, I've been thinking about this for some years, is to get deep into scripture about the remnant. Old Testament and New Testament, there is this understanding of the remnant of God. And the remnant of God, I'm convinced, is right here where Jesus is building his church, regardless of the pendulum, culturally otherwise, going left or right. No, no, we stand fast. And the unfortunate part of it, or maybe fortunate in God's good economy, the only way you might prove, we might prove that we are following Jesus is that you will be persecuted by both sides. I've tried to explain to the Lord, isn't there an easier way for a little verification? No, no, as he holds out his hands, no, no, no other way. Is the scripture essential? Absolutely. And the enemy, Satan, serpent, and otherwise in so-called leadership fashion are trying to take away and cause the confusion, as Satan always does, to take away the one thing that will tell us what is in fact essential. And that is the scripture of God. And so your battle is worth fighting. If you don't have anything worth dying for, you don't have anything worth living for. And everybody on the planet is living and dying for something. And it is our calling as a remnant of God to tell him what is worth living and dying for. And his name is Jesus, the one who has died for us. I'm going to close with this story. And it's uh, probably in our lifetime. <clears throat> Before the wall came down, during the Cold War, after the Cold War in 89, but this is uh, in Romania, communist Romania. Some years, just, just think about the, the use of the scripture here and how essential this is to these folks. The pastor, his wife, and her six small children had just read Psalm 23 while eating breakfast. Suddenly the police burst into his home to search the house and arrest him. Search for what? Ha <laughs> the Bible. The police asked him, don't you have anything to say? Have you no sorrow or regret? The pastor said carefully, you, <laughs> you are the answer to what we prayed today. We just read Psalm 23, that God prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. We had a table, but no enemies. Now you have come. If you would like anything on the table, I would like to share it with you. You were sent by God. How can you say such stupid things? We will take you to prison. You will die there. You will never see your children again. With continued ease, the pastor continued. We also read about that today. Though I pass through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. The officer shouted, everyone fears death. I know because I have seen it on their faces. The pastor continued. A shadow of a dog can't bite you, and a shadow of death can't kill you. 
You can kill us and put us in prison, but nothing bad can happen to us. We're in Christ. And if we die, he will take us to his kingdom. Now, if they killed all that family, how do we ever hear about that? And you can go back to the early centuries when they were killing them, uh, the Christians, into the arena. And they're singing hymns. And yet every now and then you read the account of a Roman soldier guarding these Christians and they're praising God. And he puts down his sword saying, I want to die with these people because they know how to live. Think about that. That doesn't make sense. No, no, it makes all the sense in this world and the next. Don't have anything worth dying for. We don't have anything worth living for. And so we live for the one and we die for the one. Whether we live or whether we die, we are in Christ. Thanks be to God. Well, thank you all for being here again as concerned Moravians and your witness. And again, I believe, uh, wonder where the Aaronic priesthood, ancient and modern is. But again, you have received a prophetic call to the whole church, not just the Moravian church, because this, this whole message goes beyond just the Moravian church, as you probably well understand. And it needs to be heard, because Jesus is worth it, and his scripture is our basis for that. Let us pray. We thank you, Father, for your mercy is great. Your claim upon our lives, uh, Lord, gives us a life. <laughs> And so uh, by your stripes, we receive your healing grace and we receive our, our calling, Lord, to follow you all the way uh, into the next life and, in the, and to have a life in this life in the meantime, according to your will and purpose. So Lord, uh, bless each and every one gathered here and may your uh, witness continue to flow through each and all as we scatter to bear witness of the fact that Jesus has come and yet uh, others will take note that we have been with Jesus when we leave this place. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead. Let us, let us. Join together, sing him 5753. Lead it.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship, communion, and the near blessing of the Holy Spirit abide with each one of us now and forevermore.